Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here. Before we kick off this week's episode, just a quick ask. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell to make sure that you never miss an episode, never miss out on any of the strategies and tactics that we're sharing to help you continue charting your own path to freedom. And if you'd like to go deeper with any of this, we've launched a free Facebook group, which you can join at pathtofreedom.com backslash group. And we've linked that in the show notes to make it easy for you to find. All right. Thank you again for being here. Let's drop in to the episode. Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome back to the Path to Freedom podcast. Today, I'm joined by David Dunsmuir, who's the newly appointed CEO of Gotcha Covered uh, franchise brand. So, David, thank you for being here. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Yeah, um, looking forward to getting to know you a little bit um, and and really getting to know Gotcha Covered a little bit better as well. It's a brand that I've been I would say familiar with for a while now, but um, I'm, I'm excited to take a little bit of a, a deeper dive and um, and share that with the audience as well. So maybe in terms of a quick introduction, give us a overview, just a quick overview of what got you covered is the the products and services that that you and your franchisees provide to their clients. Yeah, so got you covered is a uh, a North American franchise. Um, uh, business model uh, that focuses in on window treatments. Um, we provide um, a custom window treatments throughout, so like I say, North America. Um, we partner with some of the best manufacturers and design elements in, in the world, really, to provide our uh, end user consumer with some of the best choices in the window treatment uh, industry. Yeah, and, and one thing I know from my years in franchising is that the window covering industry has a very strong track record um in in particularly you know with for franchisees you know there's uh there's a very solid you know success uh track out there amongst a number of uh of pretty established window coverings franchises including gotcha covered so it's an industry i've always been a fan of um you know those that listen to this show regularly know that you know my background in franchising is all in kind of home service, home improvement, the the franchises my wife and I have owned are all in that same category. So I I personally love these types of business models. And, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that today with the gotcha sure. covered model. I think there's a lot that, you know, prospective business owners find attractive about these types of businesses, uh, especially if they're willing to keep an open mind enough to to really take a closer look at some of these types of businesses. Um, so before we dive into some of that though, you were just sharing before we started recording with me a little bit of your background and I thought it was interesting. So, you know, maybe cause, cause you're, I think you just said 90 days or so into to the CEO right. role that got you covered. So share, share with us a little bit about what you've done leading up to this, because I think it'll give some good context for the audience. Yeah. So yeah, 90 days, a little over 90 days. Um, mid July, I joined. Uh, I was uh, recruited uh, to come in and replace uh, the, my, my predecessor who decided to retire. Um, so it's been a fantastic um, intro into an outstanding company with great folks. But my background, um, I've, I've somewhat been product agnostic. I've been in the home improvement industry my whole career. I, I spent 18 years with Home Depot. I actually started uh, off in Tampa, Florida, uh, pushing carts in the parking lot. Really? Uh, back in the it's now, I think it's called a parking lot engineer now. But back then, we were called lot lot boys. <laughs> parking lot engineer does does have a, a different ring to it. That's yeah. for sure. So I was pushing carts in the summertime down in Tampa as a 19-year-old kid, and I needed a job just to uh, uh, have a job. And um, I fell, I don't know for the right terminology, but I fell in love with retail, home improvement, and specifically Home Depot at that time. And, um, you know, and, and correspondingly, I was pretty good at what I did. And so I got an opportunity to rise through the ranks. Um, great opportunities, great mentors, great people. Um, the fundamental early on fundamental that I learned was the customer has the loudest voice. Mm. And um, that was drilled into me as a young, young, young man. And I could tell you a hundred stories of how that was done. But nonetheless, it was drilled into me that uh, that was our purpose um, and why we were there. 
and understanding that and how to translate that into a, a productive PL, a productive environment where um, you developed team members and associates and, and, and leadership and all in the same aim of, of, of delivering the best service you possibly can. Yeah. So I grew up through the ranks. I had an opportunity to go up and open the first few stores in Philadelphia. Um, wow. And it came as a, in, in my early 20s, a store manager for Home Depot. Um, I'd love to tell you I was overly qualified. The truth is I think I was one of the few people that was willing to go to uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, but uh, nonetheless, I did store manager, and I was a pretty good store manager if I say so myself. And it really comes back to the fundamentals. Um, are you, are you, are you, is your team trained? Is your team equipped with the right tools? And is the customer the, the, the are you customer centric? Mm. And um, you know that was just the message I always carried. Had some more opportunities to grow my career: district manager, regional um, uh, VP with Home Depot, and then I moved to Atlanta to corporate Home Depot. And my last kind of run there was uh, involved in their at-home services business. So I oversaw a lot of the flooring business, kitchen business, bath business for uh, Home Depot. Had an opportunity to leave Home Depot, recruited. I went over to Lumber Liquidators um, and stood up their installation business. And very proud of that. We started with nothing. I mean, we we were outsourcing their in-home residential installation business. And... um, Within about four years, we were doing about $125, $130 million in residential installation labor. In-house or or through outsourcing? The the revenue was recognized in-house. The labor was a 1099 outsource. Okay. Interesting. The the operational infrastructure, the sales operational infrastructure, and the um, project management, as it were, was all done done in-house. Okay. And not dollars aside, I would tell you I was probably pr- most proud as we got to a four point eight on Google. Um, and if you know anything about flooring, hard surface flooring installs, it was pretty magical. So um, <laughs> I, I went over to the, the Lumber Liquidators sister company, Cabinets to Go. Uh, had a run there, uh, helping that. That's the kitchens um, version. Uh, kitchens a lot more complicated than flooring, but nonetheless still involved in the in in home residential installation business. And then I was recruited to go over to Rebath. Rebath is the nation's largest bathroom remodeler. It's my first foray into franchising, hmm. which was a fascinating learning curve, um, yeah. which I'd love to touch on some more. Um, pro- obviously, Lumber Liquidators, Home Depot's corporately owned, corporately um, driven retail locations with mm-hmm. services add-on. Um, so uh, Rebath was a uh, unique experience because it was uh, – uh, because of the franchising, quite frankly, yeah. the fundamentals of the business are consistent. You know, you're 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 selling a pro- you're selling a service with product, you're project managing the customer experience, and you're installing. Yep. Um, my journey took me through COVID. That was an experience. Oh, um, I bet. <laughs> uh, trying to find product around the world, yep. but nonetheless, we got through it. And then I was recruited into uh, Gotcha Covered. So here I am. Um, so my fundamentals, as I said at the top of this little section, was. The customer has the loudest voice. Are you Um, customer-centric? Can you differentiate yourself from your competition through uh, the customer experience, the customer journey? And, um, yeah, I mean, those are the fundamental core beliefs I have. And the the P&L will take care of itself if you do the right thing by the customer and and by your franchisees as well. So Yeah. um, I love that mentality, and and thank you for – running us through the background. I think there's there's some very interesting things that we can touch on, especially given your your experience working for these large, primarily retail corporations mm-hmm. and then transitioning into to a franchising model with Rebath and now got you covered. Um, you know, I, I gotta say, not that that my resume looks anything as impressive as yours, but you know, my first job out of college was working for Enterprise Rent a Car and I went through their management trainee program and you know eventually ended up managing a few different branches of my own and that was by far my biggest takeaway too was you know it was a customer service job first and foremost and you know once you get to a management level you're you're largely paid off of your branch's bottom line and you know i knew managers that 
ended up making less as a manager than they did as a as a trainee, which wasn't a whole lot to begin with, especially given, you know, we were working 60 hour weeks easy. And so you very quickly had to figure out how to drive more profitability in your branch. But we were also very largely graded based on customer satisfaction. And sure. um, man, there's so many things that that I find myself still, you know, implementing today in the businesses we own and the the consulting work that I do that that came from that kind of customer first mentality. And I'm sure it's the same in in retail. You know, when you're renting cars, at least the branches I worked at, most of the rentals we were doing were insurance driven, right? Yeah. So you're kind of starting in a hole from a customer service standpoint with most of these customers because they're just not happy to be at your rental car branch at eight o'clock on a Monday morning because someone rear ended them and now they've got to pick up a rental car. Like they're just in a crappy mood. And if you can somehow or another turn that around for them, send them out with a smile while also, you know, checking all the boxes that you need to from, from a business standpoint, um, you learn to think on your feet, you learn how to, how to really kind of take that customer first mentality. And, and I yeah. think there's a lot of lessons. So it was kind of cool to, to hear you, you know, talk about how, you learned that so early and, and have applied that and everything else that you've done, you know, since those early days. You know, just go back to my early days at Home Depot. Um, you have different types of customers. Some are coming in with an emergency. Their water heater just broke, died on them. Some are coming in to, you know, do their spring planting on flowers and plants, different kind of energy. Uh, yeah. Then you got your pro customer that's building a deck that morning and he needs his lumber. He needs in and out. Yeah. And so you need you need you need to wear different hats constantly and, and yeah. wear them on a swivel, and um, be able to adjust and and, and flex. And um, it was a great great uh, life learning experience. That, to your point, I've carried on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so you mentioned some of the learning curves when you made the transition into Rebath. You know, going into a, a franchise organization. I'd love for you to expand on some of that and and then you know I'd love to pick your brain a little bit on um you know how some of these home service franchises can differentiate themselves in the eyes of the customer compared to some of these bigger retailers because I know that's a concern that sometimes people have as they're you know looking at a home service franchise whether it be window coverings or you know, pull out shelving, or we used to own an insulation franchise. Um, you know, people look at these big box stores, for lack of a better term, and they're like, how can we compete with these guys? So I love your thoughts on that. But first, you know, what what are some of those learning curves that you had to adjust to once you, you know, made that that transition into franchising with Rebath? Yeah, the first one I would say it sounds a little bit obvious, uh, and certainly in retrospect, I should have probably anticipated it better. But you know, if you go to Rebath at the time, I think it was 130 uh, franchises. Okay. Um, 130. Uh, there was some multiple uh, unit owners in there, so it wasn't 130 owners, but you, you get the math. Sure. The point. Yeah. Um, but there's 130 locations that are independent small businesses with with owners who have got. In some cases, a slightly different agenda than the franchisor. Yeah. Um, and coming from retail where it's all corporate, and I'd walk into a store in retail, Home Depot, and say, hey, move box A to space B, it wasn't really a, a negotiation. Right. Yeah. And you get into franchising, and, you know, you don't want to come out with a contract and the agreement every uh, every 35 seconds. No. And, and it's, it was really a, a journey about – influencing and navigating and impacting not just the business mind of the owner, but the emotional mind as well. Yeah. And um, trying to really, so you had to truly understand the data, truly understand the business and truly understand what was in it for them. Yeah. Um, I'm in my, my, I don't have the franchising experience that you do, but in my, my several years in franchising, Pulling out that agreement and and you know program default management is not a a, a weapon I like to use. Sure, I mean it's there there when needed, but really it's about relationship development and it's about teaching, training, and business acumen of the owners and influencing them. So that was a step up from the corporate side, the retail side of 
managing and influencing without clear authority. Yeah. And it's a slightly different skill set than when someone works for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very different. And I mean, talk about wearing different hats. You've got different personalities, you know, with every single one of your franchisees. So it's about learning those personalities, learning how you can best get through, you know, to, to these franchisees. Cause look at the end of the day, you know, you as the franchisor and your franchisees want the same thing, right? Yeah. Which is they want their businesses to grow and they want to operate as profitably as possible. And, right. and if they're doing that, that's helping you as the franchisor grow through additional revenue from more royalties, but also it makes it a lot easier to continue, you know, growing the franchise system because happy, profitable franchisees are going to share that they're happy and profitable with other prospective franchisees that are researching the franchise. But there, there is always some tension, right? And in, in that franchise or franchisee relationship, like I, I tried my best to coach, you know, the, the candidates that I work with that, you know, that's always going to be the case. Like no franchisee is ever, if they're being truthful, going to be like, yeah, you know what? My franchisor is perfect. They're doing everything exactly the way I would like for them to do. And no right. franchisor is ever going to be like, yeah, that franchisee, nothing they could improve on. They've, yeah. they've just got this dialed. So there, there's always that kind of healthy tension. Um, what are, what are some of the things that because I, I like how you point out that like, you know, look, there's a franchise agreement and, you know, that franchise agreement could kind of be used as as a club, you know, if if needed. And and this is something that concerns, you know, some prospective franchisees. They read the agreement. It's usually, you know, clearly pretty one sided in favor of the franchise or um, and and so like what are some of the ways that you've found are there are there certain you know, tactics or strategies that you've been able to implement to, you know, get the result that you want with a franchisee, which is working in their best interest, but avoid having to, you know, go that route yeah. of, well, hey, here's what the agreement says. So here's what you have to do. Yeah. Uh, it starts off with relationships. And I think um, uh, I, that's the most important thing. Are you developing relationships? And, and in part of developing relationships, are, are you listening? Are you listening to their concerns? And are you communicating um, that you've recognized, that you've heard them? And can you do something about their concerns? And if you can, then put a plan together. If you cannot, then tell them. Okay? That's not on the agenda to be corrected this spell or, you know, however, that. but I think that transparent communication, strong listening to comprehend and clear, con transparent communication of where you stand as a franchise or what your agenda is. And if you've been listening correctly, if you understand how the PL works, hopefully your agendas align. Yeah. And clear, concise, transparent communication, developing relationships is number one. But then taking that feedback from the network, and I'm doing this right now at uh, Got You Covered, but taking that feedback from the network and saying, okay, how do we incrementally make the franchisees' lives a little bit easier, a little bit better? How do we give them better tools to be more successful to ultimately impact the customer experience? Mm. I'll put my I'll put my kind of vision in a in a, OS in a into a one sentence. My job is to create the environment and tools to take a, a, a consumer, a stranger, a consumer stranger, to becoming a company advocate. And there's multiple steps to do that along the way. But my job is to make sure the franchisees have the tools, the cultural environment, and the knowledge to go and do that on a daily, weekly basis. And then you apply some common sense branding logic, and you've got a brand that's almost untouchable because the customer experience is, is where you're going to win. Yeah. Certainly in the window treatment space and in the bath space at Rebath. There's lots of folks that can come and put uh, – uh, a bath uh, a tub in and and plumb it and make it look nice, but can they do it in an in an environment where the customers becomes an advocate for your company, and that ultimately is what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that's a, a a great way to look at it. And you know, again, so much of it comes down to relationships. And and I love what you said about just good transparent communication. I mean, you know, I've seen this with since we've been franchisees with, with some of our franchisors, you know, I, I worked a little bit in operations for, 
some of the franchise companies that that I worked with earlier in my career. And and I think a lot of times the franchisees are going to appreciate that that transparency, even if they're not getting the answer that they want. And and if you do take the time to even explain, you know, hey, this is not a priority and here's why, but here are the other things that are currently priorities and that we're, we're you know, most focused on. A lot of times that's going to put a franchisee at ease, right? Because they right. may realize like, okay, I can kind of see why this thing's not a priority right now because they're, they're working on these other things that are, that are more impactful. Um, you, you may agree sometimes franchisees have a tendency to get worked up about small things that aren't really going to move the needle in yeah. their business all that much. And, you know, sometimes that perspective from the franchise or like, Hey, I understand why maybe you're frustrated about this, but like, here's the other things that, that we're trying to fix right now. And, and this is how that's going to impact your business in a positive way. We'll address that other thing, but that's not going to move the needle in your business, whether we fix it today or, or, you know, in yeah. a few months, um, that, that communication is, is so key. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the, the different dynamic in a business like Rebath and now got you covered, uh, compared to your background with Home Depot, Lumber Liquidators, where you were, you know, it sounds like kind of rolling out an in-home installation yep. addition to that business. Um, what, what are some of the different dynamics at play? If, if you're a big retailer versus a, a smaller locally owned franchise selling the same product, yeah. the same offer to come and install it for them. First off, a lot of folks immediately think because Home Depot is 150 billion or whatever it is these days, they just have resources galore. And the truth is they've got the same uh, budgets, uh, resource deficiencies that you know, we all have, right? So it's not like they have uh, a plethora of folks just sitting around waiting for projects to do. Right. Um, so it's, the reason I mention that is because um, we're all short resourced, resourced, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so that, once you understand that, it creates almost a level playing field to a degree. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, Home Depot's budget and window treatments is a little bit higher than my overall <laughs> revenue, right? Sure, a tad, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a, we're not, we, are, we are talking about uh, 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 apples and oranges. But uh, the reason I start about the resource side, uh, and then is how do you win in that environment? And, and Rebath um, established this and, and have done a great job and to the point where Home Depot went and recruited Rebath to become a vendor. Wow um is back to the customer and when you're at a, a a mammoth company like home depot lowe's uh you see costco getting into the home improvement decor space you see sam's and um uh, bj starting to play yeah. around in that space yeah. walmart's talking about doing something in the home improvement space not necess necessarily window treatments or baths but they're talking about it looking at it they're, they've got a slightly different uh, objective. Their objective is, is to sell product. Right. And the service becomes a secondary um, bolt-on that is a must-have, but is not necessarily um, the primary driver of their business. Yeah. And so as a smaller um, independent or smaller franchisee or entity like Gotcha Covered, the sweet spot for us is to take that installation white glove touch point and elevate it where Home Depot, etc., cannot touch it because they don't have the, um, the resources, but they also don't have the mindset. They're just trying to drive as much product through the register as possible. And so if you can switch that narrative to the consumer and say, hey, we're going to get you the right product and, and, and how you phrase this and how you package this, you know, is important. But it's not, might not be. It's not going to be the, exactly the same product you're going to buy off the shelf at Home Depot. It's going to be a price difference. Yeah. But let me explain to you the features and benefits of why, and you're selling on value, but you're also selling on the experience. Yeah. And the discretionary residential income consumer is looking for that experience. Yep. Um, and 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 that's why there's so many companies in so many different uh, verticals 
um, competing against Home Depot, uh, et cetera, because that quality is not there. Quality of experience is not there. Um, you might get a better price, but you're not necessarily going to get a better experience nor better outcome. Right. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. So for the listeners, maybe kind of walk us through what that client experience should look like if they're working with with Gotcha Covered. Maybe from you know their initial outreach to inquire to you know the the designing component of it yeah. all the way through installation. And I mean, you don't have to get too into the weeds, but I think that might give the listeners a little more context in terms of how it's a different experience than, you know, walking into Home Depot, picking yeah. out a product on the shelf and then, you know, getting their help to install it. We'll get right back to the episode in just a minute. But if you've been considering business ownership, if you're already a business owner looking to expand and you're curious about franchising, I'd love to connect with you, answer any initial questions that you have, talk about a specific franchise and detail the exact process that I use and have taken hundreds of people through to help them understand franchise ownership find the right franchise for them and conduct the necessary due diligence. Click the link in the show notes if you'd like to schedule a free, no obligation strategy call. I look forward to talking with you. And now back to the episode. Yep. So first and foremost, before I get into that process, uh, I got you covered. Our franchisees are trained by the industry best. They're trained on products. They're trained on design. And you can never... Um, uh, underestimate how important that is. Yeah. And, and just to compare, again, back to Home Depot, there's many cases, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to Home Depot um, folks, but in many cases, they're getting trained on bathtubs today, kitchens yeah. tomorrow, and blinds on Thursday. All we sell is our window treatments. And so the training is robust. It's in-depth. Um, the vendors are world-class, uh, putting them through their universities. We have our own uh, university. So that's a backdrop and understanding that uh, there's a there's a depth in knowledge on products. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, but yeah, so first thing is a lead comes through, um, and most of the leads that come into Gotcha Covered are either uh, through um, uh, online, but also through a lot of networking that we do, mm -hmm. uh, networking with interior designers, uh, et cetera, real estate agents. But once a lead comes into the, the network, um, part of that operational process that's white glove is speed to lead is crucial. You, you, that consumer generally, as a rule of thumb, is looking at three, maybe four um, entities to come in and look at their uh, windows. Yeah. And so speed to lead to get reach out to that consumer is imperative. And so we have support infrastructure to support those consume, uh, sorry, franchisees through call centers, et cetera. But speed to lead Get a hold of that consumer. Set an appointment as quickly possible. Don't necessarily like to use the phrase pre-qualify, but you certainly want to have a, a good quality conversation to make sure that you're not wasting each other's time. That yeah. you're, you're in the same, you're on the same page. Yeah. Maybe not in the same paragraph yet, but you're on the same page. Yeah. There's a balance there. You don't want to over-qualify, but you yeah. don't want to yeah. do none of that either. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going out to I don't know paint a wall as opposed to you know, window treatment, <laughs> right. right fix a broken window pane <laughs> yeah something um and then you know quickly getting out to the uh, appointment as quickly as possible obviously to the consumer's satisfaction and this is where the magic really starts and we spend a lot of time teaching and training on this part is the first few minutes uh, and i'd like to say it's 10 12 15 minutes you're not talking product at this point. You're not talking uh, price. You're not talking anything. You're developing a rapport with the consumer. Yep. And you're developing um, you're developing a level of trust. You're explaining who got you covered is. You're explaining who you are as a franchise um, e. You're explaining about your uh, history and your you know. And ultimately, you want that consumer to look you in the eye and says, "You are the contractor of choice for me." Yeah. And once you get to that point, then you get into design. The design will translate into dollars and cents, but you're listening to the consumer, you know, and you can already tell through first few minutes in the home what their what their fashion style is, what their color palette is, what their uh, sense of uh, traditional versus modern, and so you can already start eliminating certain product lines or SKUs, etc. 
And then it's the, once you get through the contractor of choice conversation, it's really about what are the products that are interested and in? what are you trying to achieve? Yep. And then you're getting into the design. And then the, the output from that will be um, a quote. Um, and we give, all, we, give, we give all our franchisees all the tools you'll ever need um, from financing, uh, how to handle an objection. Uh, a lot of consumers don't like a one-sit close. Yeah. Um, and so how do you overcome that and what the follow-up mechanisms are? So we spend a lot of time teaching training on that. Um, and you're not going to get that with Home Depot. You're not going to get that with Lowe's. They're going to come in. They're not going to de- develop the rapport. They're going to tell you, okay, for this product on this window, this shape, this size is X dollars. How would you like to pay? Um, and then ultimately I would say the white glove experience, it comes down to two, that's the starting point. The next couple of one is how do you project manage that consumer? Because the consumer is going to give you a deposit. And if, if, if the average consumer is like my wife, for example, she's nervous. It just gave uh, a a somewhat stranger, you know, maybe, I don't know, make up a number, $2,000. Sure. And, um, what, did I do the right thing? Buyer's remorse. Some, did, did I pick the right color? Did I do? Am I ever going to hear uh, from them again? <laughs> I hear from them again, right? That's notorious in the home improvement industry. Yeah. And um, holding that consumer's hand. Well, now they're a customer because they're buying from you. But holding that customer's hand through that three-week period from uh, when you order product as a franchisee to the installation time frame communication and then with modern technology it's so easy just to keep people abreast yeah texting etc and then come install time you know and uh, are you going to show up on time are you going to demonstrate the respect for the household yep. are you going to protect the floors and protect the furniture are you going to recommend that she move that vase because it you know might get hit yeah yeah um and, and so on and it's that level of um attention to detail and attention to respect to the consumer's home and I'm making it sound really easy, but once you get that process figured, once you get those nuances tied down, um, you're going to win. And you're going to win consistently, and your reputation and, and referrals will grow. And you're yep. going to win in your, your location. We'll get right back to the episode, but I wanted to quickly share a free resource with you. If you're curious about franchise ownership and want to learn more about how countless people, including myself, have leveraged franchising as a way to create more freedom for themselves and to take control of their livelihood, I've put together an ebook. It's called Franchise Wealth Creation, and it's the perfect starting point for anyone that's just curious to learn more about this whole franchise thing. And how I've helped hundreds of other people navigate all the steps involved in understanding and researching franchising. So click the link in the show notes, fill out a short form. I'll send you the ebook. I think it's a great starting point if you're curious at all about learning more about franchising. All right, let's get back to the episode. Thank you for walking us through that because I think it's important for for people to understand this, right? Because again, I, I... have experience owning these types of businesses where i mean that process you just explained you know is is almost identical to our shelf genie process right just different product different part of the home and you know so many times when when someone's first introduced or first considering this type of business their first thought is oh window coverings like there's so many companies out there that do window coverings how could there be room for another window coverings business in my market, how would I ever compete? And what people need to understand is, you know, there are different flavors of companies out there that provide, you know, at least at at surface level, the same product, but so much of it comes down to experience. And so, you know, what you guys do, it got you covered. That's not going to be the best option for some people, right? There are plenty of people out there that are making these types of decisions solely based on price. Where can I get it the cheapest, right? They'll install the window coverings themselves. They'll, you know, have their, their brother-in-law who's a handyman install it. Like they just want the, the cheapest way to get it done. But then there's also many, many people out there that want more of that premium experience. And this is, this is kind of a convenience thing too, right? Like we're living in a house that we just moved into about three and a half months ago. We spent a year and a half building the house. And uh, I'm a little ashamed to say this to you, but we don't have 
a single window covering installed yet. All right now we got a little bit of land, so we don't have like neighbors, you know, looking yeah, in yeah. on us and stuff. But, um, you know, that's kind of the next project that we're going to tackle, right, is is the window coverings. And my wife just kind of wanted to live in the house for a little bit, see exactly what she wanted to, yeah, yeah. to do. But as we we're going through this building process, the the biggest pain point that sticks out to me, we had a great builder, so we didn't have a ton of headaches and it was it was a much, much smoother process than than I've heard most people say their their home building project was. But flooring, we went to no less than five flooring showrooms, spent at least an hour at every single one of them, more than an hour at a couple of them laid samples out on the floor um you know we're trying to like match up like paint samples to floor samples and tile samples it was a disaster right i mean it was so time consuming we kind of felt like we were just guessing in terms of like all right what is this actually going to look like once it's done and so you know that option where you guys are bringing this experience to the customer in their own home they don't have to get in the car and drive like we have three kids you know like we yep. sure as hell weren't taking all of our kids into the the flooring showroom with us so we had to like figure out all right who's going to watch the kids while we're doing this it, it took out a huge chunk of our day um that's part of that experience right there's absolutely a convenience factor to it as well and there's a lot of people out there that are willing to pay a, a premium for that so um in terms of product options i imagine you guys are are pretty comparable in terms of the the options the variety that yeah. someone would find if they went to home depot or lowe's um you already kind of mentioned it's not going to be the same price point necessarily but are, are you guys in a position to to really offer just as many if not more options to someone than they would find at one of the big box stores yeah, significantly more uh, than you yeah. find at the big box. They're, they're, they've got uh, dollars per square foot performance uh, expectations. Um, mm. We don't because we're ordering custom job Old by demand. job by job. Yeah. Uh, so we don't have the overhead or the inventory to carry. But also, um, it's I would say it like this. It's, it's kind of like if you go to um, – um, the supermarket and they have ice cream and you've got vanilla or chocolate and then you go down the road to the ice cream specialty store and they've got 52 flavors yeah 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 uh, uh, you might pay an extra 50 cents for that cone but you're getting better service you're getting a better experience and you're getting pistachio yeah the exact the, flavor, the exact right? flavor that you want that's a good i think that's a uh, that's a good way to look at it um yeah that's a really good point you bring up is you know so different than these big retailers you don't have to manage inventory with a business right. like this and you know i'll i'll kind of point this out and tell me if i'm i'm missing anything here but you know one of the biggest things i find people are are focused on is they're evaluating a franchise opportunities how quickly can it start cash flowing right and and obviously no one can make any guarantees in terms of how much revenue you'll do coming out of the gate and you know what your cash flow will look like but you know, this is the type of business model where I see on a very regular basis, franchisees get to cash flow much quicker than in, in some other types of businesses. Because as you mentioned, you don't have as much overhead in, in this business, right? You're not carrying inventory. You're not having to place this huge order of product and then hold it and hope that you sell through it. You're ordering on demand, right? And you're taking a deposit. You mentioned that earlier. And so, say that's a fifty percent deposit. I know that's what we do in in our shelf genie business. Um, you know, you're probably more than covering your cost of materials on that deposit. Then you turn around and you order it. And then I would imagine, in most cases, you know, the the client's paying you the final balance the same day that you complete the installation. And so, Correct. that's a really fluid cash flow model. Compared to, to so many other types of businesses, you know, we owned an insulation business for three and a half years and, you know, we had a 4,000 square foot warehouse full of inventory, right? And it, it was not an easy feat to figure out the right inventory mix to, to keep on hand at any given time. On top of that, you know, 70% of our business came from home builders, right? They don't give you a deposit. They tell you they're going to pay you in 30 days. 
It's more it's like 90, 90 days. Yeah. I've never heard the phrase checks in the mail so many times until we started working with home builders. Right. Um, that's not an ideal cash flow model in a business. That is not. And I would say that Gotcha Covered is a great opportunity for someone who can uh, an, uh, work from home business. Your car is your billboard you're, and, and you're conducting business in the consumer's home. Yeah. It's a fantastic business model. The margins are healthy and the, the cash flow is it quick turn turns quickly. Yeah. And if you can get out and market network marketing um, and be aggressive on the marketing side, you can have a very uh, lucrative business um, in time. And I would say based on my other experiences, that time is a lot shorter. Yeah, you would see it's uh, some of the other. Yeah, it's it's got the potential, right? There's there's no guarantees. It all falls to to each individual franchise owner to take the system and the playbook that you guys have in place, execute it, put in the work. You know what I see in any of these types of businesses is that you know the top performing franchisees, whether it's Got You Covered or Shelf Genie or you know any of these other home service businesses, the top performers are the ones that don't just sit back and rely on their paid marketing and advertising to drive right. all their leads. They do all of that. They probably invest a good bit more than whatever their their marketing minimums are. But in addition to that, they're out there doing the networking, like you said, with interior designers and real estate agents and other right. trades and, and contractors that are working with the exact same clientele that that you're looking for. And you know, if you do that consistently over time, it pays massive dividends yeah. You in the it. long run, I see a lot of people give up on it. You know, they do it kind of half ass for for the first six or twelve months, and it's not. You, know, you don't get that instant gratification like you do when you double your pay per click budget and and you start seeing some more right. leads coming in. But man, if you stick with it, it's going to drive your business, and it's gonna it's gonna help you build a more profitable business, right? Because you're just slashing into that Very much that so. marketing cost. Very much so. And so, um, you know, as the referral lead is going to be a better close rate and generally you're going to get a slightly average ticket than you will yeah. if if it's seo or yeah you know. what we find what we find with our shelf genie business is is exactly what you said but but even to the extent where like some of our clients almost get into like a little competition with themselves right where you know we'll literally have uh like a, a client that we're doing an install for and they'll go get their neighbor before we're done installing it, bring them in to see it. And then the neighbor's calling us and then they want to know like how much the, the, the first client paid for their job and they want to like one up them a little bit. Like we, <laughs> we see a little bit of that, yeah, yeah. you know, keeping up with the Joneses mentality, yeah. which, uh, you know, is, is kind of funny, but it, it, it really is at play sometimes. Um, well, so uh, that, I, would, I would just say, sorry to interrupt, uh, yeah. it's a very exciting time in the window treatment space, especially, I would say also specifically uh, got you covered. Some federal regulations recently removed cords from blinds. So going forward, oh. um, cords are no longer uh, permissible. And um, huh. what you're also seeing is a huge investment in automation. Yes. So... Um, Talk a little bit more. What does automation mean in the window covering business? So, um, you know, if you're if you're if you're inclined, I'm not personally just my nature. You can have your Alexa or your Google uh, control your windows, right? Yeah. And if you've got the if you've got the type of windows, you know, large windows uh, facing west, evening sun. I mean, you can tell Alexa to close your blinds along with your thermostat, all the way through to uh, remote control. Um, um, shades shutters etc that can you know work remotely um and so you can program some of these so they they, they close at certain times during the day so you're not getting that intense heat yeah. coming into your house so that modern technology along with some federal regulations is shifting the landscape somewhat and what we're finding is and you can't buy that at home depot and you can't buy that technology uh, off the shelf. And you probably you really, don't want just anyone installing it either. Correct. It's very specific training. So oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the industry shifting somewhat, and um, it's a great time if you're a franchise e to come on board and figure that out with us because the average ticket's going up. The, the oh, I would say so <laughs> yeah. with all of that. So with these federal regulations. Um, 
what does that mean for the people that already have blinds in their home with cords in them? Are they going to be required to replace those nope. over a certain period of time? Or is it just new window covering cells going forward? That's no longer going to be an option. New, new, new sales going forward. Okay. Interesting. I'd not, not heard about that. Um, Hey, with the, with the automation, um, are, are you guys getting into any of the like window tinting products that are out there? Privacy we're, tinting, yeah. um, smart glass, any of that type of stuff? We're exploring it. Yeah. It's uh, not been a primary feature for us, but it's, right. it's a growing category and we're exploring it. Yeah. Exploring. That there, there's some interesting stuff there. Like my, my wife wants to get, um, some sort of like tinted privacy glass on the front window instead of, you know, like uh, of our front door, instead of putting any sort of a window covering there, doing like yeah. the frosted glass that you can't actually see through, but, you know, gives you a little bit of privacy if someone had, you know, yeah. walked up to the front door. There's a lot, there's a lot of interesting technology and automation, um, you know, in, in so many of these home service industries, but in particularly with, um, with window coverings and, um, you know, makes me a little nervous about what it's going to cost to <laughs> put the coverings in, in this place. But um, it would be cool to, to incorporate some of that automation. Um, speaking of technology, I want to, uh, you, you, you mentioned technology when you were talking about this customer experience that got you covered is able to provide. And you, you know, you, you mentioned it in particular to communication and, and totally agree with that, right? Like this is a way a company like Gotcha Covered can really outshine most of their competitors is just good, regular, consistent communication with their clients. And so much of that can be automated. But, you know, as you kind of alluded, so many home service companies and contractors just kind of have a bad reputation for not showing up on time, not doing what they say they're going to do, um, you know, finishing projects late. Uh, all of the above. And so this is an easy way that a good franchise can really give their franchisees a massive edge. Are there any other ways that you guys are using technology throughout the sales process? I'm thinking, you know, 3D visualizers or anything yeah. like that. Are you able to kind of, you know, use technology to help a, a client really see what the different options would look like in their home? Yeah, we have um, an in-home sales tool that helps visualize the product in that right. space yeah uh, modern technology um and you can and chop and change it right on the spot so it, it gives the consumer the cust potential customer um you know, exactly what it looks like you know you've seen it on amazon v visualize this in your house yep same concept same technology um and it's tied to our crm and so if that's the one the consumer picks that's the color Literally, with a click of a button, it, it, it transcribes into a, uh, a, a pick list, uh, for lack of a better term. And a few more clicks later, you can literally order the product and, and, and drive a quote. So the technology is there. Um, it's very exciting, I will say. It's, it, it, it turns what used to be walking in with 20, 30 books of <laughs> fabric samples into Don't more. Put on the counter. Yeah, and, and, and you still have some of that because people want to touch and feel um, some of the fabrics. Makes sense, yeah. But, um, you know, for the, the, the core core SKUs, you, online can demonstrate a lot of it. So a lot of technology in play. And the technology also comes to play, you know, through the, the ordering process. Um, once upon a time, you might be ordering three manufacturers, and then you need what I call sundries, nuts and bolts and screws. Uh-huh. You know, that, that could take you two hours once you get back to the shop or back home right. to process. A lot, of the, a lot of those components just happen with a click of a button now. Interesting. Yeah. Great examples, um, you know, of, of other ways that you guys are incorporating technology. And like for those out there listening, I mean, some of this may sound simple, right? But the difference between having all of this in place, right, with with a system that you're trained on, versus having to come in and try to build all of this yourself because you know that's the other pushback that you get right sometimes is is people are like well if i want to get into the window coverings business i'll just start it on my own what do, what do i need a franchise to do that for and you know i think everything you've heard david lay out here about the gotcha covered opportunity is 
just gives you the ability to run faster, right? Like you're going to get to that point of being able to open your business and actually start generating revenue so much faster than if you tried to, you know, go in and replicate, you know, this process. I mean, how long has got you covered been around as a brand at this point? Uh, 25 years. Yeah. So, you know, you, going anywhere. You, if you come in as a franchisee in 2025, you know, you're benefiting from 25, 26 years of trial and error and refining you know, the business model and that's all kind of handed to you, you know, with, with the support to, um, to kind of back you. So I want to kind of end on this. Um, what are you looking for in a franchisee? And, and if you have maybe even one or two examples of some of your top performing franchisees, you know, in terms of previous experience before they came in to got you covered and, you know, long-term, what is the, ideal role of the business owner you, you talked a little bit about networking and things like that but you know are most of your owners going in and running the the sales appointments in the home do they kind of phase themselves out of that as the business grows like who are you looking for and what does that that role of the owner ideally evolve into the ideal owner I don't know if that's the right phrase because they're all over the shop but uh a great example of a, a, an owner would be someone that's coming from a customer service background. Okay. And we've got some guys that came from the IT world. We've got folks that have come from um, the window treatment space. We've got folks that came from restaurants. Um, but they're understanding um, the customer-centric need for this industry and business. Secondarily, they've got to be administratively sound, meaning they know how to make paperwork happen quickly and efficiently and effectively. And then thirdly, they got to be technically sound uh, and or learn to be technically sound. And what do I mean by that? They got to understand the products pretty quickly, and they got to know how they get installed and, and and that whole process. Those are the three components I look for in an ideal owner, uh, and also someone who's willing to invest in the future. To your point earlier, um, you know, it, it, the the, good, the world of Google doesn't happen overnight, and you got to invest time, money, and energy yeah. into it, uh, and understand that it takes time. Um, but those three components, uh, customer centric, technically sound, administratively sound are the three largest components, a specific background. Like I said, primarily, if you've had some customer experience, it just helps to give you confidence to walk into a consumer's home. Sure. Um, cool. Most, I would say, I think almost all start with an owner operator. Um, they're, they're hands on when they start. And then many graduate to being a, a, a distant hands on operator. Um, and hire a general manager or a sales leader at some component. Um, but yeah, the, the opportunity is fantastic. The, the average revenues are very healthy and the margins are very healthy. It got you covered. And um, yeah, it's an exciting business. It's also trendy, if that's the right word, because yeah. the fashion change and yeah. um, you got to stay on top of that. So that's a great point. That's a great point. The the styles change so often, and and I I think it's trendy also in the sense that uh, you know these types of businesses are getting more and more attention. You know, there's a lot of talk out there about you know millennials and even younger generations wanting to get into quote unquote boring businesses, um, and I think more and more people are realizing the the benefits of owning their own business and yep. doing that sooner versus working you know, a long career for someone else. And so I think some of these home service type businesses are getting more of a spotlight, but you know, the, some of them are probably too dirty and too boring for a lot of people. Uh, but something like window coverings kind of falls into a sweet spot where, yeah, you know, yeah. it's still cool to talk about, right. It's, it's design, it's decor, uh, like you said, there's a trendy component to the actual product. So yeah, it's an interesting space. Like I said, at the, at the top of the episode, you know, um, got you covered has got a, a great history and track record, but the window coverings industry as a whole, you know, has, has a really strong track sure. record. It's, it's not, you know, as tied to the economy as so many other businesses are. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a really, really good opportunity. And it sounds like David, you're bringing, uh, some good fresh perspectives, some new energy and, and a really interesting background into the gotcha covered system. So it'll be exciting to see uh, where yeah. you guys go from here with you at the helm. Love to connect with you again and get you up, keep, keep you updated. Yeah, absolutely. We'll stay in touch. Um, in closing, where can people connect with you? Where can they 
uh, learn more about Got You Covered, whether interested in a franchise opportunity or you know maybe they're they're like me and they're getting ready to uh, make an investment in some window coverings for themselves. Gotchacovered.com. We have all our locations of all, all our franchise opportunities and even my contact information's in there. So gotchacovered.com. Love it. That'll be in the show notes. Make it easy for people to find. David Dunsmer, got you covered. Thank you so much. Thank you.